Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. What a pleasure it is to see so many people and new people besides. Thank you for joining us. And to our virtual audience, um, welcome. And if you have questions that you want to pose, please put them into the comments field and Patrick will come out and read them to us as we go on. Are you all set? Great. So here we are with Burner, the gray man. So some of you may have been influenced by the movie already as to what you envision the gray man is. How many of you have seen the gray man by now? Aha. I told Mark that when he had a movie, he'd find more readers. <laughs> And sure enough. So you're welcome to ask questions, and Mark will use his own discretion about whether he wants to answer them about the movie. And with us tonight is Kyle Mills, who has been um, the author, who is the author of many books, and we've been old friends for a long time, and became the um, Vince Flynn, Mitch Rapp guy after Vince died. So we're really happy to see him. Um, and he lives part of the year out of the country, so we don't always get to capture him. But he was here in September. And with any luck, he will be back next September on, if I can swing it, September 9th with William Kent Kruger. But I don't know if my influence in Simon & Schuster will go to that extent. Sure <laughs> we'll find out. Anyway, um, I'm really pleased. Um, if I recall right, I engineered this program in part because you had not, up until last fall, you had not had a chance to meet Mark. Do I have that right? No, no VoucherCon. Yeah, we just met. When I introduced we, we you at VoucherCon? At, yeah. at a conference in September or whenever it was. It was, yeah. yeah. You've gotten to be taller. I can't hug you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's so somehow you see. Yeah, I've got my lifts in. <laughs> no kidding, it's been wonderful. So um, I know that you got to read Burner because you posted a wonderful picture of yourself weeks ago. So why don't I turn this over to you and see what you have to say to Mark? All right, all right. I don't know if everybody knows his resume. It's in, kind of incredible. You this was your twelfth Gray Man. Mm -hmm. You've Correct. done uh, an original audio with Armored. Yeah. Then wrote a book about it. Yeah going to write another book about it yeah you've done some a book with rip rollins yeah, yeah. and you're thinking about you're going to do another one yeah we're definitely doing a sequel yeah. doing another one of mm -hmm. those yeah. not yeah. not to mention tom clancy universe right. not only writing with tom but uh for right. tom after he passed away yeah, yeah. yeah and a few books that you've never published right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> four books under book. i don't know why we're bringing that up so well <laughs> because honestly i find really not it, part of my resume <laughs> It's I not, find it's it not incredible. The hits. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, you you haven't even been doing this. I don't think half as long as me. You've written way more books. Well, I am. Um, my first book came out in '09, and I'll, I I was ghostwriter on a couple books that aren't mentioned. So this, so Burner's my 23rd book since '09, and I can't keep going at this pace. <laughs> well, that was I, one I, of my questions. You know, yeah. I, you know I, yeah. Okay, I didn't, didn't mean to step on your question, but no. yeah, no, I mean I. Um, this year I'm writing two books. Next year I'm going to write one book. The year after that I'll might write two books so what are you two what are your two for this year uh this year is the 13th gray man which i'm working on now and um the second book in the josh duffy series which armored was the first book mm -hmm. so um are you planning uh, on doing that for a long is that going to keep going i don't know yeah. i really don't know and it, it i mean not to get too inside baseball they actually offered me to uh, a deal to do two more books and i was like let me just agree to one because I got an idea for one. I don't have an idea for two and I don't want to get out over my skis. So um, I, I will write it in the second half of this year, the the second armored book, and it'll be out next summer. So I'll have two books out next year. Could I in interpolate a question? Do I have some dim idea that armored has been optioned for a movie or something else besides the gray man? Yeah. Armored has been optioned by Sony. And the last I heard, I had a, like a zoom meeting with a, a screenwriter or a, maybe bringing it to television so like as a, as a series so we shall see you know I, I i say that well now that i've had a movie made it's not a million to one chance i'll have another one it's like a million to two chance i have another one it's still like an incredible long shot and it never won't be but yeah so is this now that you've done it i mean has this always been a dream of yours and now this is the dream come true to become a really successful novelist I I didn't have that much ambition. Like I really just wanted to be published. And I like I remember my ambition being like I didn't believe anything else would happen, but I thought it'd be really great to like hold a book with my name on it and some artwork and some cool title 
and a bunch of words inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Embossed. Yeah. So yeah. So like when I remember the first time I saw the cover of the first Gray Man, I remember feeling like this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. My I was babysitting my three year old nephew and I couldn't get him to understand what I was trying to explain to him as far as what was going on. I was like, the moment was lost on him. He's 18 now. So uh, he'd probably pick up on it. But, uh, but I just remember going like they, they sent me the image, you know, it, it wasn't physical. It was just like, I got an email with the cover and I just remember just being like, Oh my gosh, I've, I've achieved the pinnacle. And that was in 2000, early 2009, I guess. And, um, but I've, I just keep writing and they keep letting me. So that's the moment though, isn't it funny? Your first book to see the cover. Yeah. Then you feel like right. I'm an author. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was the thing that I'd always, and, and I really, I, I didn't plan on the gray man being a series until they asked me if I wanted to do two more. And I was like, uh, about what? And they're like, you're the writer, man. We, we, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know really how this, uh, this worked. And, um, and I, I really, you know, I, yeah, I wanted to be an author, but I didn't think it would ever happen. I remember like, you know, thinking it'd be so cool to be like a Tom Clancy or somebody like that. But I, I was literally just desperately trying to get a book out with my name on it and didn't look that much further down the road. But it wasn't easy. Like you didn't, weren't a guy that had a ton of contacts in New York or anything. You had to do no. it kind of the old fashioned way. Right? I didn't know any authors and I didn't know anybody that knew any authors. And it, there's this and, and I know you, same thing happens to you. Like people reach out to you and they think there's some kind of pixie dust. If you talk to, you know, if, if you, you talk to them, you're going to get published, you know, talk to me, you know, I, I'll get you published or something. So everybody's like, Hey, I want to have coffee and, you know, talk about writing. And then when you have the, the, in the olden days, when I would have these conversations, it would sort of be like, so how do you become a writer? And I'm like, Oh, I was hoping you had <laughs> a little more. And it, it, a little more specific. Yeah, a little more specific <laughs> questions. Um, but yeah, and, I, and I'm just like, you just sort of have to do it. And, and every minute you spend talking to an author about it, it's probably not going to get you any closer. I, when I tell people that I've had uh, four books that or three books that d I wrote that didn't get published, it kind of shows them I don't really have the juice to get them published because <laughs> I have my own books in it that, that they've said no to. So. so can I interrupt for a minute and say, I remember The Gray Man when it came out in 2009. Yeah. Yep. Um, Mark and I have been together ever since. And at that point, um, paperbacks were, in fact, the um, much more popular, much bigger than they are now, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I remember because my first book deal, it was just a mass market paperback. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to my agent and, and saying, like, is this OK that, you know, it's paperback and it's not a hardcover release? And he said he's, he'd seen a lot of authors where publishers had like sort of spent a lot of money on them and they didn't produce. And he's like, I think it's great to start out in paperback. And and I I liked his advice and I think he was totally right. And it. My first hardcover was um, Backblast, which was my fifth Gray Man book. Right. The first, first four. What? And so I, I, I've had multiple people email me, and they'd be like, um, yeah, I've lost your all four of your first hardbacks. <laughs> Is there any way you could like hook me up with another one or, or something like that? And I'm going like, you didn't lose them. <laughs> I've never seen no. them. But from and then they get mad at you. <laughs> and then they get mad. Because right. they're like, but my collection is hard. That's back. right. Yeah. yeah. And then I do not read paperback. There's a lot of people that are like, I don't read paperback. And I'm like, all right, well, I, can, I guess I'll just read the book to you. I don't know what else I can do. Audio. Well, yeah, you know. audio. Audio. So, the, so then you got hooked up with Tom Clancy. How did that happen? I mean, that must have kind of blown you away. Yeah, it did. Um, I'd only had two books out, my first two Gray Man novels. And I had a deal to do some ghostwriting. So I was working on that. And my agent called me. It, I, I felt like my editor had been ducking me for a couple of weeks. And because I turned in my third gray man book, Ballistic, and the first two books, he came back and told me what he thought pretty quickly. But this one, I wasn't hearing from him. I wasn't hearing from him. So I started freaking out. I thought he, you know, that he was just sitting up there in New York going like, this book is awful. Um, <laughs> but at the time, he was looking for a co-author for Tom Clancy, who was another of, of his client, of, of his um, authors. And so they came to me, my agent called me and asked me if I'd be interested. And, and I was really terrified. Like, I felt like it was, you know, I wanted to go up to the next level, the next rung of the ladder. I didn't want to go up to Tom Clancy level that, that quickly. 
but I was, I, I knew that I couldn't like tell my agent, nah, it's okay. I'm good. Um, and I was just like, somehow you've got to figure it out and, and make this happen. So it took a few months for me to get the Clancy gig. And I actually wrote, I did a tryout on my own. No one asked me to, they were, they were asking if I was interested. They might've been asking other people if they were interested. And I just wanted them to commit one way or the other. And so I said, I will just write 50 pages or 30 pages or something as if it, it was a Tom Clancy novel, just to show that I know who all the characters are and, um, you know, their relationships. And so I wrote that and then I got, and then I went to Baltimore and met Tom and then, uh, yeah, I did, we did three books before he passed away in 2013. And then the family asked me to continue. So I, I did four more. So is that a weird transition? Cause it's kind of unique a little bit that you were working with him yeah. and then you had to suddenly work on your, I'm trying to think of another example of that maybe Cussler. Scott, yeah, somebody the somebody's probably there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah it, I felt it was so funny. I felt I have this imposter syndrome and I felt like so not ready to, to be involved with Clancy when it started. But when he passed away, if they'd gone to anybody else to continue the series, I would have been like, you guys are crazy. I'm the right guy for this. Cause I'd, I'd done three books and, um, you know, had ideas and I was really in tune with the characters at the time. It's funny. I, I wrote my last Clancy book in 2016 and I look back on it and I go like, did that really happen? Did I really write seven Clancy books in six years you know, or co-write? while I was writing Gray Man books, most of the same years, and uh, I, I couldn't do it now. But I don't I, have the output. <laughs> the courage, I mean, I found Tom to be super intimidating. Every time Did I met him, him yeah. yeah, every time I talked to him, I think he, he, he looks at you like, I think he thinks I'm really stupid. <laughs> and I, like, I don't know why I could never shake that. He's a perfectly nice guy. But. Yeah, um, I had been warned by like everybody in his orbit that it's like, all right, you're gonna go up there and it's gonna be like a 45 minute meeting and it's gonna, you know, he can be a little gruff and, you know, and I was there for five hours and we had lunch and hung out with his wife. It was, it was a, it was a really nice experience, but at the same time, it was very intimidating because I'm sitting there in his office and he's, you know, talking about the engines that the Chinese are using in their fifth generation fighters or whatever. And I'm going like, I don't know this. Do I pretend like I do? Uh, <laughs> I just start making up names and stuff. I mean, he, he's, he's, he's a, uniquely brilliant guy yeah. as evidenced by the fact the internet didn't exist when he wrote when he wrote his first you know six or seven novels i can't imagine and then you had to get your mind around that universe too yes which was vast absolutely and it, and you know you felt like suddenly you're involved in a phenomenon for the first time in your life you know you're like i was bartending not you know not right. too long ago <laughs> and now i'm like you know help working on a tom clancy novel it was it was the first thriller I ever bought in my life was Patriot Games, which is a Tom Clancy novel. When really? I was, I was 19, yeah. And that that's where I found my love for writing thrillers. I loved to read nonfiction, uh, military and politics and, and espionage and stuff like that. And I saw Patriot Games somewhere, and it was about the IRA. And I was doing a ton of research on the IRA at the time. I was, I took a, I was taking a class called um, International Terrorism in the Criminal Justice Department in college. And I was like, everybody's been talking about Tom Clancy for like three years at this point. Now he's written a book about the IRA. It's like, I'll just pick this up and see if it's any good. And then I just, I realized you can learn a bunch of real things and be incredibly entertained at the same time. And that's what I've, that's the way I've always tried to write. It's like, I don't want to ever get preachy to people, but I want to like do the research to get some real information in there and put it within the narrative of like a crazy wild over the top story. Right. And so that actually is a strange segue into the movie. Cause I know you haven't toured since that, or you haven't had a book come out right since the movie. That's right? correct. Yeah. So, so everybody I'm sure wants to hear about the movie. And I know Tom, this may be a little, in fact, wrote a fairly colorful uh, letter about, I think it was Patriot games to the head of the studio. Cause he had all kinds of issues with it. So, but on the other hand, Vince Flynn would say, you know, movies, you know, you throw your book over a wall and they throw money back to you and that's the end of the transaction, you just wander <laughs> off. <laughs> and so where do you come down on that? Because oh. the movie was great, but it didn't necessarily, I wouldn't say, follow lots Yeah, step I'd say it's, it was maybe 60% of the book and 40% Hollywood and Fast and Furious and stuff. I, I mean, it, it couldn't be as good. Everybody laughs. I was totally serious. <laughs> Um, I mean, it couldn't be as gritty as the gray man. I mean, it yeah. could have, but for the amount of money they put into it and the um, amount of, you know, 
people they needed to stream it to make money. They, you know, decisions were made as far as like the tone of the story. I thought um, the representation of uh, Ryan Gosling as Gentry was done really well and really deftly. Yeah, that was great. And I, you know, I remember because I I talked to the directors before they wrote the first uh, draft of the script, or Joe Russo wrote the first script. And I, I remember talking to him about some aspects of the character, but then there were other things in there. I was like, I don't even remember talking to them about that. I'm, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you know that they they picked up on that. But they also they were writing it to be a franchise from the very beginning. Whereas when I was writing The Gray Man, I was just trying to be a published author. I just wanted to like sit in my cubicle at, at my day job and go, screw y'all, I've got a book, you know, or so, I don't know what I wanted to do. Something along those lines. Um, that was that was my ambition. So I wasn't planning out books two and books three. I actually had a conversation with Tom Clancy, and I asked him if he, you know, because the the Clancy books aren't completely chronological. They'll go. He'll, and I and I asked him. I was like, "Did you plan out the Jack Ryan thing?" And I I completely believe him. He said, "Yeah, absolutely. I did. There was gonna, this was going to happen. This was going to happen. Then I was going to go back and show you know this." Um, do you mean throughout his whole series? He played well, at least or, in the early part the, of the series. Yeah, his at books least the, were the size of a series. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, at least the, the first four or five books. Um, really? he, he went into depth about how he had this plan for this character's development or whatever, and I didn't have any of that. So, in the in the screenplay, they were planning on making it a franchise. So they introduced characters that don't come along till book five or book two of the of the of the se series. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to introduce them because they're building like a, a longer arc, which I don't even know what that arc is. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it will intersect and where it will divide. I know which book they're doing for this. They're, they're doing a sequel to The Gray Man. And I, I, I don't think I never asked permission to say which book it is. But the, the screenwriter told me which one that they're working on adapting. I don't know when it will come out, but it is. Um, but it is one, based on one of the books in the series, so that's good. Yeah, overall, I'm like happy happy with the film because I see it as a commercial for my work, and I was glad that if they'd gotten Gentry really wrong, I would have been like incredibly like upset with the whole thing, and they didn't. I thought they they really got him. Also, the relationship between the little girl and Gentry uh, was really really well done. It was it could have easily been like really overbaked and and schmaltzy or over the top, and it would have changed to that character Gentry was to me. And so I'm glad they didn't do that. I will say in the book, the little girl, Claire Fitzroy, has some agency in what happens to her. She actually is clever and, and helps save herself. Whereas in the movie, she's just sort of like a, a pawn to be rescued by the hero type of thing. Um, so I, you know, that was a difference to where I'm like, maybe it would have taken more pages in the screenplay to, to flesh out but they're just two different mediums and you have to look at them like that, you know, and I, people email me and they're like, why did you let them do this? Why did you let them do that? And it's like, you know, Stephen King, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the bag of money over the wall. Um, you just, you know, like I, I optioned this in Hollywood the first time before the book even came out and it was a paperback and it was not a lot of money. And I wasn't just doing it for the, I, I wasn't doing it for the money at all, which, Sounds like a lie until I tell you the other, like, you know, reason. I was doing it so I could tell people that it had been optioned in Hollywood <laughs> and, and use that as a way to, like, you know, perk people up when I'm like, hey, I'm another, I'm another dude with a, with a little paperback, you know. Um, I wanted to be like, yeah, this has been optioned by, at first it was New Regency and then it was Sony. Um, and, and that was, like, the, the best part of the whole deal was I was like, yeah, you know, Hollywood's doing something with this. And I didn't think there was any chance whatsoever. It's that little built-in credibility. Exactly, that, it was a little know, bit of love. a little bit of credibility when you need it. Like when your first book comes out and you're, you know, signing three books to for three people in a two-hour signing at a library somewhere, and um, and to you know to know, to have that fact that the option was out there was was good for me. Yeah, absolutely. And now, do I understand there's also maybe a spinoff? Yes, and I know nothing about it, and that's not me being cagey. I literally know nothing about so it. So you don't it, even know what the char which character it I is? I don't know which character it is. I know who's writing it. It's a guy Rhett, named Rhett Reese, who was one of the writers on Deadpool. Hmm. Um, they're writing a spinoff, I believe, for television uh, of something from the Gray Man series. Hmm. So, um, you know, we can all 
watch it together or whatever, whatever it's uh, I really don't know anything about it um, and that's that may seem improbable but I, I really really don't yeah, they don't tell you even yeah, I was at the premiere last summer and um, you know which was really cool we got to meet some of the actors not all of them even though they were all in the same room just they were gone by the time we got to uh, but Reggae Jean Page who is one of the actors he mm -hmm. plays Denny Carmichael in it um, I was talking to him and we were just chatting and I was like uh, gosh I hope they I hope they do another and he kind of cocked his head and he looked at me and he's like you don't know and I was like <laughs> know what and he goes oh, something's cooking <laughs> he just goes something's cooking and it was like he was like well I guess if they haven't told this idiot I guess I, I don't want to be the one to, there's probably a reason for that he just goes something's cooking and then it was like the the film came out on the 22nd of July and the 26th of July they announced there's going to be another a sequel so I think they already knew before. No yeah. respect. No respect. For respect. Yeah. Nobody it's, cares yeah. about an author <laughs> or a screenwriter. Yeah. 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 So with you, we talked about a little bit how Tom planned out series, but I mean, you've got a pretty complex universe going now too. Yes. <clears throat> and you wrote Sierra Six, which gave us some backstory. Had you always kind of planned on doing that? Because that's a little dangerous because you can kind of do violence to your universe if you get things wrong. Yes. Getting things wrong as I guess as I get older or deeper into this, I'm just kind of going to let that happen here and there. Um, it's it's just really hard. And people just angrily will email you and be like, well, this happened in February. And why is it not snowing or, or whatever? And, and <laughs> you, you get those emails. And early in my career, I was just obsessed with like, proving people wrong or like covering my my butt in my books and and I would put details in the books explaining why the you know the muzzle velocity of this gun had been altered by five feet a second or something like that but it's not good writing and and my editor Tom would be like yeah you're going a little long here and I realized it was just because it's like I know I'm going to get that email from that you know 500 gun guys going like well wait a second uh he's using steel case ammo or whatever you know um, so it, it, you know, as you get 12 books in and these books average 150 something thousand words each. So, you know, we're, we're pushing 2 million words in the gray man universe, I guess my math is no one said there'd be math tonight. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to get some stuff wrong, you know, you, especially with like the canon, and like one of my early examples, apologies to anybody that's come see me talk before, because I, I feel like I bring this up all the time, because it's like a quick shorthand of like how you screw stuff up. In the first Gray Man book, um, I say that he's from outside of Tallahassee. And I think in the third Gray Man book, I just miss or fourth or something, I misremembered that. I didn't, I, never, I didn't go back to look, you know, you're writing two books a year, you're just trying to crank it out. And you're like, ah, eh, somebody will catch it. But I, I said he was he lived outside of Jacksonville. Um, so I did that, and the book came out, and then somebody was like, hey, you said he lived outside of Tallahassee. So I looked for a town on the highway between Tallahassee and Jacksonville, <laughs> and I wanted it to be a town that had a cool name. And so it's actually a lot closer to Jacksonville than Tallahassee. Um, it's a town called Glen St. Mary, and I, I put that in there, and I went into detail and backblast about where he was, uh, you know, it, you know, and I just, I just Google Street viewed it. I just basically walked that whole place. <laughs> And so I've been like, I've gotten emails from like the, that county newspaper going like, what is your connection with Glen St. Mary? And, you know, there's, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and um, yeah, now people are like, oh, wow, I, I, have, I have a house on Claude Allen Road. What, you know, when were you here? And I, and I always, e I do email these people back and I'm always like, yeah, it's not the story you want to hear, but. <laughs> I just Google Maps you uh, out of necessity, but you, you do make mistakes in in the series, and also I haven't age I don't age my character, which right. I mean you know you're going through the same thing, and some people do like Daniel Silva brilliantly has aged Gabriel Alon, and I think Stephen Hunter as well, right? Yeah, so yeah Daniel sure. Silva has actually moved Gabriel out of the spy, you know, he's, yeah. he's back to being an art restorer in Venice in his right. last book, right? Um, but I mean, you know, if you had Court Gentry aging in real time, um, I think in the first book I said he was born in 1972 or something like that. Um, so he'd be like in his 50s now, and it's just he'd be, he'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like somebody that. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So I, you know, it's it's kind of 
hard having him like dive off of a scaffold and like land in a parkour roll and because i'm 55 so i just like yeah I'm, I'm saying like yeah i couldn't have done that 20 years ago but i really couldn't do it now so how do you handle younger characters though because you've got maybe a young uh, a kid and then that kid do you age that kid and then eventually they're older than court that hasn't <laughs> that <laughs> really, happen. i'm asking this for myself yeah no <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, that's a good question. So I don't have any like recurring children characters. It's it's usually the same like half dozen characters in each book or in different books. But in the, in the first Gray Man book, there's this character that was in the movie, Claire Fitzroy. And I've had so many people going like, are you going to do a spinoff of Claire Fitzroy? And I'm like, she's like a seventh grader that's like, you know, doing something geopolitical. It's like, it's like, it's a great idea. I just don't know that i'm gonna spend six months doing she's it she's older now right? yeah so, she'd be older now she'd probably be like yeah, yeah. seven mm -hmm. all right so here's the you you told me last week i could ask you anything so <laughs> this is where you pay for it all right um what are i was you, young and i needed the money yes oh right. that's always the answer yeah. <clears throat> what are you doing that the rest of us aren't what what makes the gray man a unique series and to be clear i already have my answer so i just want to see what you're gonna um, I don't know that I'm doing something that other people aren't doing. I think the you, I think I have a decent combination of uh, a protagonist who's got toughness, mental toughness, and he also has empathy for others, and he also has a lot of vulnerabilities. And I think people can relate to that. Putting that together, and I don't really know what else it is. I think you know my character has got a good sardonic sense of humor because I have a half a year to think up those lines, you know, and this is, I don't have to do it off the cuff. Um, so I, I don't know. I think that that makes him kind of, I wish I knew. I, I'm going to tell you every, every, okay, good. Um, every <laughs> time I second guess like something I'm writing, I'm, I, I tell myself, I'm like, you've made it this far. Just do what you think is right. Because I will say like, well, what do people think this? I'm, I'm an insecure writer overall, like a very, and, um, and my wife, who's back there, can tell you, like, every July, I just think the book that I've been working on for six months is just horrible. And it's, you turn in the first draft, and then you get a second draft, and then you start to fix all the little, you know, you know where the bodies are buried, and you start fixing them, and then finally I start to like it. But um, I don't really have a good answer. Uh, What's no, your, I need your, funny, I need the, an the wives take, and the husbands and wives of writers just take a terrible beating. Yeah. Is that pulling your hair out it's, it's really the only person you can tough. tell nobody's ever gonna want to read yeah. this crap. i can't call my editor and go like i'm really <laughs> terrible because yeah. uh he's not he's not going to that's not yeah no for me what i love about your series is your willingness to take risks i mean you wrote a book in the first person you yeah. you interlace with sierra six two like full-size novels yeah. together yeah. and which is something you hadn't done in the past yeah do you do that because you're like, geez, I need a new challenge, or do you do it because you think that's the best way to tell my story? I think it's the, the best way to tell the story, but I'm sort of obsessed with not covering, like doing something twice. And we've all, you know, I'm a reader first and foremost, and we, we've all read theories of books where you go, oh, this guy's just, just started phoning it in at this point of their career. And now that I'm here, you know, I'm far enough in my career, I'm like, they're not phoning it in. It's just impossible to come up with a different way that somebody follows another guy down the street. You know, it's like, yeah. it, it may seem repetitive, but it's like, you come up with another way to do it, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I have this joke that like, I'm at some point I'm going to be writing a, uh, like a knife fight in a hot tub and I'm going to be like, Oh my God, this is my third knife fight in a hot tub. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like sooner or later, like every permutation will be, out. So I, I feel like that's why my, my I feel like that's why my stories are different. Oh, I want to ask a question. Oh, I think Actually, you're... I wanted to offer a She's comment. Like, wrap it because, up. No, 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 no. She, she wants to ask a question. No, no. But I was thinking because in the beginning, just so for fun, we could talk about this book for just a moment. Um, Burner, I, I know you were. Um, Burner has a really interesting um, sequence in the opening where Kurt is blowing up things. Yeah. But but he has a, a kind of a moral code that yeah. I find really interesting. And, you know, it really came into play in the opening parts here of Burner. So yeah. I think that makes him 
intriguing. Yeah, he he has this moral compass that might not be like everybody else's, but you know, I I think he stays true to it. And in one of my books, Gunmetal Gray, at the end, I remember when I was writing it, I was going like, "All right, he wants to let this guy that he rescued go back to Taiwan where he wants to go, but the the CIA wants to debrief him because he was a Chinese guy or whatever." A China, not a Chinese guy. He was a Chinese like intelligence officer, and um, and I thought, well, the fans are going to get mad if like court goes against the CIA just to give this kid the thing that he wants, which is just to be away from all of this. And I and I was like, but you know, I think it's right for the character, like, the the gray man, the court gentry character. That's how they. That's what he would do. So I'm, you know, I need to stay true to that. So. I I like I, I like the the shifting moral compass. And in the beginning of Burner, this book, Court is not affiliated with the CIA. He's totally on his own. So he's taken a job from a shady Ukrainian oligarch to blow up the mega yachts of shady Russian oligarchs, which is kind of a uh, shady oligarch is <laughs> sort of uh, misplaced. But so he's going around the world and destroying these yachts, like scuba diving under and putting limpet mines on him and, and blowing them up. And, um, and he's basically doing that because of what's happening in the war in Ukraine. And he has no way to like get into, get into Russia and put a knife in the ribs of the, of a general to make a difference in the war. So it's almost, he's just sort of passively aggressively, like blowing up the, the rich Russian stuff. And then the CIA tracks him down and they send him on a mission. But yeah, he, he, he's doing the only thing he can think to do at, at that point as a freelancer to, you know, affect things, I guess. What's the dedication for your book? Oh, the dedication for the book. And it's also how I'm signing the book. So if you, I'll sign my books any way you want me to sign them. But if, if you just don't care, I will write uh, Slava Ukraini, which just means glory to Ukraine. It's just, I'm very pro-Ukraine and very anti-Russian. And you would think there wouldn't be that many pro-russians these days but um they're, they're out there um so it they might even be here they, sure they might be here so that you this brings me to an interesting point of you wrote about ukraine which is kind of dangerous yeah, yeah so obviously it worked but did did that come into your thinking at all that oh what happens if the war is over or or whatever. Yeah, I mean, last spring and summer, that's all I thought about was like, oh, I'm really, you know, I have to kind of prognosticate where things are, where, where things will be next February. And I got m most of it right. And the stuff that I w was too cynical about uh, as far as like uh, support in the West, which has been better than I think any of us could have expected and you know, pleasantly so. Um there, you still, even with that in the real world, you still see the fissures and you still see the people saying, you know, we need to end this war. And so the plot of this book involves a potential peace treaty, which is very cynical in it, and it protects Russian interests at the expense of Ukrainian territory and Ukrainian lives. And I could see something like that happening. Maybe not now. I mean, you know, like we've had some really good news recently as far as the French doing, uh, giving the Leclerc tanks and America giving the Abrams tanks, which you know, doesn't really m make as much sense because I think they're a little bit more complicated. And then the Challenger tanks from the UK and um, the Leopard 2s from Germany. So that's, uh, that's going to benefit Ukraine. And, that, and that's really good news. But at the same time, two things that happen in, in Burner that have happened is there are people, there are voices out there in the U.S. government, in other governments, and you know, Germany, um, and in political punditry that are supporting Russia or just against any sort of conflict. I mean, you know, any sort of conflict against uh, Ukraine, and so that is happening. And then the other thing that's happening is this book involves people in the West who are taking bribes from the Russians to influence uh, things in their, in their scope. And just like three weeks ago, the former head of um, counterintelligence in the New York office of the FBI was arrested for taking money from Oleg Deripaska, who's a uh, oligarch supporter of, of Putin. And, uh, you know, uh, the international criminal court, they caught a 
Russian GRU officer who'd gotten a job as an intern there, pretending to be a Brazilian. And um, God, what else? Oh, this guy in Germany who's a member of their BND, the German Foreign Intelligence, was arrested for spying for Russia just in the last couple months. So my book has a lot of people in the West that are actually on the take from Russia, and um, all that's kind of blowing up kind of right now. But yeah, it was really scary when I was writing the book because it's like, you know, I had to predict that, okay, Russia will have a lot of territory in the East, and, um, but they won't have Kiev, and they, you know, the war will still be ongoing, yada, yada. But the focus is more on their asymmetrical... Absolutely, uh, yeah. So not one page not, of this book takes place in Ukraine. There's, there's no tanks or anything <clears throat> in the story. It's an espionage novel, but it, over the backdrop of, of the war in Ukraine. Right. And then also I think the big thing in this book is the relationships between yeah. Zoya and Court. Yeah. And is that something you think you're going to pursue? You know, it's, I mean, it's really different to have the lone wolf and yeah. and the not, not uh, she's an imperfect right. <laughs> person too. Yeah, so the, that's a good point. So, so there's a lot of will they or won't they with Court and Zoya Zakharova, who's his on again, off again, depending on what book I'm working on and where I need the plot to go, uh, love interest. She's in this story... And she's in a very, very dark place emotionally, um, not as if you've read any of the other books, not as you've seen Zoya before. Like she when she comes into this book in a very kind of desperate situation because of a lot of, you know, things that are happening to her and her mental state isn't that healthy. And I, I, I just like leaning into psychology and relationships and things like that. I mean, these are action novels. You know, there's like a... Like, you know, the hero like rolls his portion into a tree, you know, you know, like like into the top of a tree, um, you know, so the, it's there's, you know, wacky action and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, I really wanted to lean into the emotions of uh, the war. So there's a character named Alex Valesky, who's a Ukrainian who's lost his family and he's at the heart of this story. And like his emotions are, are very visceral in the story because of, of what he's been through. Um, there's a, a Russian guy named uh, uh, Igor Krupkin, yeah. Uh, you forget the names. <laughs> I'm 40,000 words into the next book, and I was like, I'm not going to remember all these names. Um, and and he has very personal reasons for why he's trying to stop the Kremlin. And um, Court and Zoya have very personal reasons for why, th why they're doing what they do. And I, I just think it makes better fiction if you have, like, these, like, real personal stakes of characters that you care about. And, um, you know, it's it's less important than, you know, how many drones are shooting, how many missiles, you know, it's the the you only care about these stories if the if the characters are important to you. Yeah. All books are about people. Right. They're right. About tanks. Right. It, because they, all books are read by people. If, if a book was about butterflies, it would still be about people because it's, it's right. they're read by people. Yeah, exactly. So let me ask you. I don't know. How, are we doing okay on time? Uh, we're doing okay. And okay. but before we're done, we need to talk to you about your book for a few minutes okay. too. Well, okay. let me let me ask one question here. Sure. That, this is sort of a finishing question. So, what's next? I mean, you've got so many projects going on. Can you can you list them all for us? <laughs> I mean, yeah. That, I mean, I'm doing book thirteen in the Gray Man series. It'll be out next February. Book fourteen will be out February twenty five. Um, I'm doing the second book in the Armored series. I'm doing the second book in the Red Metal series. Uh, that's been delayed. I don't know how much longer it's going to be delayed. When the war kicked off, uh, my co-author, uh, Rip Rawlings, who w was an active duty Marine lieutenant colonel when we wrote, when Red Metal came out, he's since retired. And then the war kicked off, and he and his wife, who was a Navy uh, combat surgeon, um, now she's an endocrinologist, or she does surgery on the endocrine system. I don't know what, how, to, how to pronounce that. Endocrinologist. Yeah, but endocrinologist, I think, is a doc, yeah, it says, it was, anyway, she'll, she'll correct me. Um, I love those people. Anyway, they went over to Poland, and then Rip went into Ukraine, like right when the war started, at the actual absolute most diciest in the west of Ukraine. And um, he started a foundation to support a battalion of foreign fighters over there, uh, a task force there, and... Uh, I've been su supporting it, and other people have been supporting it, and he's getting them everything from uniforms to optics to trucks to um, 
trailers to move equipment and he's been in and out of Ukraine, spending a good bit of time in Poland, and I think he's in the U.S. now. But this has become his focus, and so Red Metal, me and our agent and our editor and everybody agrees is like, yeah, we'll do Red Metal when we can do Red Metal. <laughs> right now, he's you know he's he's impacting things over there, which is awesome. So I, I will do that book. I'm not exactly sure when it is, and then I have other things that I I want to do, you know, future wise, but. I'll probably keep doing one gray man book a year, at least for the um, foreseeable future, if they like. So you're going to slow down a little bit? I, I, yeah, I need, I need to dial it back. It's, it's harder. You spend the same amount of hours working and you get fewer words than you used to, you know, That's because you, I, my joke is, is like, I, this is my 23rd book. When I think up something cool, I can't think of the first cool thing. I have to think of the 24th cool thing that, you know, before I can write it because I've already, I've already used those first 23, you know, thing. let's, let's say somebody's going to take a jet to Europe. It's like, how do you write that scene? If you've done that 16 times, you know, it's like right. you, you have to do it a little different or whatever. So it just, it, it makes you go slower. So I will well, slow down. And now with the, uh, you know, so many books in the series, you, you almost have to just think up a new way to describe the character. Cause you always have to think about that person that's never read one right. of the books yeah. and not bore the, to tears the person that's read Ab every single one. Absolutely. So every book is standalone. You don't have to read them in any order. Um, so there's a point on page. It probably averages at like page 40 or something where it basically says who's who and what's what. And I, I do it pretty econ economically yeah. different ways each time. But in just a few paragraphs, you understand that the heroes of a former CIA officer and the agency had been after him for a while and now he has kind of this detente with certain people in the CIA and, and does some contract work sometimes. So yeah, you do have to like reestablish that with every book for the people that haven't read the other. Yeah. There's an interesting question. Since Sierra Six is the one that has Kurt's backstory, mm -hmm. it would be different if you read it first if you'd never read a Kurt Gentry than if you come to it having read Kurt Gentry. Um yeah, I guess so. Like you do yeah, because if you read CR6 first, you would learn about him joining this paramilitary unit. And then if you read uh, On Target, which was the second Gray Man book, that introduces the fact that he had done that in the past. And you, you would already know about it. I don't think it would really ruin the story or anything no. like that. But, it, but it, yeah, you're right. It would get a little jumbled in your head. So if you do have all 12 books, don't just like throw them up in the air and then just close your eyes and grab one. If you do have all 12 books, you can start with book one and go forward. But, but you know, I always say, because I've, I've read a bunch of series in my life too, it's right. like people don't always remember, you know, every detail. They remember more details than I want them to when I get something wrong. <laughs> right. But you're also really great at research. Since I do the store Instagram, I see Mark's posting and Allison's posting on Instagram and you've gone to a lot of trouble to travel to, you know, scenes. And yeah. What, and, you know, so you're not making all of it up. You're really there getting the feeling for it. Yeah. I've always liked location research. This book was like a book when you tell people what location research you did, they're like, yeah, to write a book. Because I went to, the, we went to the Caribbean island of St. Lucia, and we went to Milan and right. Zurich and Geneva. So I've had other books where I've been in Algeria or El Salvador or whatever, but uh, this this one was more, um, I guess, a, a little higher end than some <laughs> some of my right. book tours. I loved your scenes in Milan. I thought they were terrific. Thank um, you. I really, yeah, really right. did. Thank so, you. Vince, let's talk about you for just a minute. Vince. Vince. <laughs> <laughs> Fell right into that, didn't I? <laughs> and Mitch. I, I okay, well, there's identification. So since you've asked Mark what it was like to take up with Tom Clancy, what was it like for you? Because you were the author of quite a few books before um, Vince Flynn sadly died. Um, how did you feel about Mitch Rapp, and how did that come to you? Uh, yeah, kind of a call out of the blue. Um, I had known, actually, my wife had called me and said, oh, you know, Vince Flynn died, and... Uh, I didn't, I, I realized he, I, he was sick, but I didn't know that he was that ill. And you know, I remember kind of selfishly thinking, geez, at the end of The Survivor, like the, the book didn't really finish. And, you know, Mitch is just hanging there. I hope they find somebody good to at least write one more and, you know, have him die in a horrible explosion or retired something for closure. And, uh, yeah, I got a call a few weeks later asking if I wanted to potentially do that. So. I wasn't sure, honestly. Um, I had written some books for Robert Ludlum, 
the, the Ludlam estate. And uh, I, so I said, well, I'm going to reread The Survivor again and see if I can think of something to do with it. And I, don't know, I sent him a thing saying, yeah, I, I, here's an idea of where I go with it, but I probably won't really do this because once it gets on the page, it'll probably look stupid and I'll change my mind 10 times. And I thought, well, I'm never going to get that job. And they said, what, a, what a salesman. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I honestly wasn't sure. Yeah, so, so it would, uh, and they said, sure, that'd be fine. So <laughs> off I went. Vince had a, a fairly established universe and characters, so yeah. you had to go back, I'm assuming, and do a fair amount of, you know, yeah. rereading or whatever it might be to get yourself immersed in it. Yeah, because I've read those books like everybody, right, as a fan, like over, whatever, 15 years, not necessarily in order. So I had to go back and read them all in order and took like 140 pages of notes and everything. Because, you know, like you say, I mean, if you get a detail wrong, particularly... Yeah. You know, yeah, if you're taking it, over, it's oh not my gosh. great. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it comes off less as stupid and more as almost disrespectful. Right. So um, I did not want to make a mistake. So I did all that research, and then, you know, Vince had not been kind to me. He had he'd arced this story, so it never didn't finish. But he killed the bad guy. <laughs> so it was really a very difficult thing to continue, and I kind of figured out how I thought he might have done it, and. I had assumed because I'm a big outliner, probably the biggest outliner in the world. I write for a hundred thousand page book, I'll write a 30, 35,000 word outline, which nobody else does. Nobody in their right mind does, but <laughs> I assumed he'd write some kind of outline and he had written three pages of the book. So I would never write three pages of the book without a total idea of where it was going to go, everything, how to all the research done. And so I said, Okay, I'll take it on. Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, he's like, have Lisa, his wife, send me the box. And they're like, what box? So all the box of everything. Yeah. It's three, it was. It was three pages in a box. And uh, so I, it, you should ask questions before you take a job. That's lots of questions. But you don't, you're not a big outline. Like, you don't write huge outlines either. Do no, I don't. Um, for the book I'm writing now is probably the most in-depth one I've done. Um, because last year, with this More book, than Sierra 6. More in yeah, I did not map that one out oh, that really? much beforehand. And and Burner, I didn't map it out much beforehand. And ended up changing a lot of things as I got deeper into it. Um, so I was like, all right, I need to be more organized. So... I would like to be like I have fantasies of, of like having this perfect outline where each chapter is, out, you know, and it's just then it's just paint by numbers and uh, nothing remotely close to that's ever happened. It's always on the day and freaking out and writing something and going, well, that doesn't make sense speak for something that happens later in the story or writing the book way out of sequence. I'll write like, you know, the parts of the last act, you know, before I write the opening scene sometimes and um that's, I, I wish my brain worked more efficiently, but it just is this big chaos. So you have the whole thing where it quartz upside down in the tree in the car, and you're like, oh, shoot, I, I don't know how he's going to get out of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. In some way that he hasn't done before. Yeah. You gotta, then you got to go for a long run or take a long shower or something. Yeah. Like I take my well. dogs to the park. Or <laughs> what I try and do is write somewhere else in the book, just move to another place. And then you're like, oh, something is, you know, great will come into my head. And, Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You just do the best. You There's can. that subconscious, though, that is Keeps always working, working on it. On yeah, it. absolutely. You don't really realize yeah, it. I've, all of a sudden you I've come up, up with answers to things, you know, while working on other parts or while not writing or whatever, without even, like, consciously thinking about it. It just sort of, like, the, the, the best part, and maybe it's the same for you, the best part of the entire writing, writing process is when two non-connected parts of the story suddenly make sense together you're like mm. well but if i said that they both work for the same swiss bank then that would connect these two things you know whatever you know um that's that moment where you're like oh my gosh this book is gonna look like it makes sense to other people you know and it's like <laughs> to me i'm still lost but you know this so writing is not a linear process they we're working out so before we ask questions where what are you working on there's going to be another mitch rap coming at yes. us when Code Red uh, in so on September twelfth. That will be released. Or possibly here on or September possibly night. Years, if, if you throw your influence around, it's going to be a few days earlier than that. <laughs> I'm doing that because I'm going on a cruise of the Great Lakes on September tenth. <laughs> so I have to figure out a way to make this work out. Anyway, it's always nice to know that your favorite authors have a new book coming, right? So you don't have to panic. How about questions from the audience? Well, Mark, you want to take over and Pick. go ahead. 
with the thought process and the shift to the first person in a minute and a half. I just, well, I just got into your series about the last three months. Okay, great. I powered through it and just finished that. Uh -huh. A little backstory my, my daughter had spent a year and a half in Croatia. Mm. So reading that book was a bit troublesome mm. for me. Um, with yeah. my daughter, yeah, yeah. it's very hard to get through. But sure. absolutely fantastic on the first person shift. And so I'm curious as to what. Thank you. How did that storyline come out? That's a, a prequel. Two, yeah, two, two things were going on there. One is I'd kind of always wanted to write in the first person. Um, the first Gray Man book I ever wrote was called Goon Squad. It never got published, but it introduced the Gray Man character. And I got it in front of an agent who's still my agent to this day. He wasn't my agent then because I didn't have anything that he could sell. But he he said, I like this character, the Gray Man, but I don't, I'm not, I don't love this story, and I don't think you should do first person. I think it'll seem stronger in third person. So I was... One Minute Out was nine books in or ten books in, and nine nine books in, and I kind of wanted to do first person, and also this seemed like the right book, that seemed like the right book to do it in, because there's large swaths of One Minute Out where he's got no one to play off of, and I really, like, no other characters with him, he's by himself, and I think Court is at his best in dialogue with other people, and, and the back and forth that way. So I was like, all right, maybe he'll just be sort of like having an internal monologue, and people will follow that along. And honestly, I got mo it's one of my it's the only Gray Man book that hit number one on the Times list. It has like a ninety five percent four or five stars on Amazon, but I've got more negatives from that than any of my other books. And it was just because it was different, you know, they they didn't like it. And then a lot of people be like, I hate first person. I'm like, you hate Catcher in the Rye? You hate Moby Dick? You know, you're sitting there thinking of like different first person stories. And it's like, I don't know that you could just say I, I hate first person. I got person. used to you doing it the other yeah, way. Yeah, it was just different. It. it was just yeah. different. And um, and I thought it would take a few beats for people to, to follow along. And honestly, most people did. And um, I might do it again at some point. I don't, I don't know if I will or not. It wasn't to like exercise a muscle or to like do something cool. I just thought, it would work right for that character, and I always thought that it would sound cool to be in his head a little bit. Yes, sir. How much of it do you get stuck in your head just thinking that it sounds good for a few scenes and it would actually be feasible and that you somehow get there? Yeah, I... I make it up in my head but i'd make it up based on some sort of research usually i not always sometimes it's just crazy stuff you know but like i took a stunt driving class and worked that into mission critical and i've you know done scuba diving and worked that into an action sequence you know here and there um things along that line and i like to do location research I, i've literally like climbed up a wall and I'm like, I can't get over this wall, but could you, if you got here, what, is there light that would show on that or not? But then at a certain point, you just, you just want to have the reader emote over the story, and it doesn't matter if it's right or not. I, there was a, a real place that I used in my book, Agent in Place, um, where this woman is, they, they're trying to capture this woman who is a, the mistress of the president of Syria, and she's in Paris. And I went to the real place, and I went all around, and there was no balcony. And I was like, well, I kind of need a balcony. So I put a balcony on there. And and, um, <laughs> and I don't care. Um, if people want to email me and say there's no balcony, I'm just like, okay. Uh, just say the story needed it. Yeah, the story needed it. The story needed it. So I think that's what I'm trying to say is like, I definitely do research and I do stuff with firearms and I've done all these different things, but it's, so it, it's all based on something, but I am sitting there on a couch with my laptop in my lap when I think it up. I'm not out there like, you know, storyboarding it or, you know, like reenacting it or anything like that. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, I'll answer that question first. Or was that the two questions? That's one. Okay, good. Um, I don't remember exactly how I came up with the name Court Gentry, although his name at first was different. It was Chris Travers, who is now another character in the book. So I, 
I really don't remember, it, but it wasn't anything inspired. I was just bouncing different names around, and I liked the sound of it or something. But at one point, he was Chris Travers, and he, I kind of like Chris Travers more than I like Port Gentry, but uh, name-wise. Um, is it hard to come up with names? It's really hard um, when you have so many books. I, I use all these dumb little ways to find names. Like I literally will look up the national volleyball team in Kazakhstan, if I need a Kazakh person, and I'll use a first name from this person and a last name from this person. Um, and I usually do, do volleyball because nobody knows volleyball players. It's not <laughs> It's not like you're going to be like, Shaquille O'Neal walked in the... You know, it, it, it's going to be it's going to be something like a little more obscure. But I, I do that a lot. And I think I think I've plumbed the name of every French volleyball player in, in, in one book or another. So I'll do other you know, I'll do other versions of that. But it does get tough and you, you don't want to repeat names. I had a, um, uh, a, a character in this book named Lacey. And then in the book I'm writing now, there was a there was a character name that I was wrote several chapters and it, I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was very close to Lacey. And, uh, then I was like, wait, that's a character in the series. Now I can't use that. So anyway, yeah. Oh yeah, no, I definitely care. No, I think it, it's it's really great, and I I just never thought it was going to happen. So when it happened, it's that still that thing where you're like, you just never know. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm happy with the movie. Uh, my wife and I went to the premiere, and we had a really good time. And you know, that's all it is to me. Like it, it doesn't really affect my life. I mean, yes, it's gotten me like more readers and uh, 250 million hours streamed in the first 28 days. Um, I, I don't have 250 million readers, but, uh, I don't know how that translates, but, but it, so it's been really good, but like, just when you're writing, you know, you know how it is. It's like, you're thinking about next year's book right now. I'm thinking about next year's book. I'm panicking about next year's book. Um, so even when the, when the film came out, uh, I was in a hotel in West Hollywood till three o'clock that afternoon in the, in the lobby working on, um, burner and, so you always have to look down the road, especially and even when there's all this attention on you for this book, you have to like shake it off and go, OK, but next year's book is going to be a train wreck if I'm not, if I don't work hard on it. So, Yes, sir. Yeah. But red metal doesn't really sound like there's a similarity to what's happening in Burn or at least the implications of politics. How are you seeing those influence you? You're the same person. Yeah. Writing about each of these influences. You're not trying to replicate them, but there's got to be some sort of influence happening in your playing. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, the, the main influence would be like some of the research kind of like uh, dovetails between one project and another. But I like, I look at red metal as a military thriller that rip. Uh, my co-author and I like plotted out and planned about a, a Russian attack into Poland and Germany, and then another Russian attack into the Horn of Africa. And so Burner is about uh, Russian foreign intelligence money laundering uh, through a bank in Switzerland to influence, to, to bribe people in the West. So it, they both have a Russian military, you know, thing at their core but they feel very, very different. There's not that many, and you know this, uh, there's not that many like peer opponents in the world. So if you've written a book about North Korea in, in the Clancy world, I'll, I'll still write one in the, in the Gray Man world or in the Josh Duffy world or something like that. You, you definitely don't want to cover the same ground, but other than the research kind of carrying over, like... I've, I've been to Beijing, and that worked its way into Gunmetal Gray, which was a Gray Man book, but I went to Beijing for uh, Threat Vector, which was my second Tom Clancy novel, and I just used the same, you know, kind of same research, same pictures. I didn't use the same locations or anything like that. There was other stuff that happened, but it, it, is, a, it is an interesting question because you, you, you really don't, when you're working on different worlds, you want them to be very different and distinct. And I never really had a problem when I wrote the Clancy stuff 
ja confusing Jack Ryan and, and Court Gentry. Like, they just felt like two different worlds when I worked on them. So that's all. Do you have maybe one more question? Okay. Two more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks. Well, if you look to your left, did you, yeah, did you, <laughs> did he set you up for this? Oh, uh, uh, oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is Jack Stewart, who is also an author, and he was a Navy Reserve pilot uh, a year and a half ago, and, and I got to fly in the back seat of one of his F-18s, one of his many F-18s. <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's a good explanation, but yeah, I mean, that... For the longest time, I had the hardest time saying like what the coolest thing I, I got to do research-wise, and it, I mean, it was most definitely it was it, it was that hour and a half or, or so that we were flying, and it was an hour and twenty minutes of that were really great, and uh, <laughs> there was about ten minutes where I did not want to be on that airplane, but uh, it was right in the middle. I shook it off. Nothing bad happened, and. Uh, and then everything went great. I mean, that was that was simply the coolest thing. Um, I I was on a destroyer once, and and uh, it it wasn't the equipment. It was like meeting the people, like literally, like a twenty year old female Navy person that has this like job that's like tougher than anything I've ever done in my entire life. You know, it's like these young people are given like this incredible responsibility and and very little thanks for it, and it was just really impactful. And that made its way into everything I've written since then, you know, that, that these people are out there and they don't even seem real if you're, if you haven't been around them, so, but getting to, getting to meet people like that. My question is on Back to the Great Antiquity, um, as far as like the second one, mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, just from everybody that once you sign the book, oh, you know, the book's over, you don't come back to it. Right. They don't have to. Con yeah. Con contractually, they don't have to. Um, I met Steve McFeely, who's writing the second one. Uh, he's written some of the Marvel films and and was co-author on the, or co-screenwriter for Gray Man. And I've, I've met him and we've talked, but I don't know that they'll ever reach out to me or anything. It's there. The the cinematic version of it is is theirs, and the books are mine, and they're always going to be the same. I, people have asked me, they're like, "Are you going to change stuff in the book because of the movie?" And I'm like, "What are you talking about? Why would I do that?" You know, it's like they're just two different worlds, and it would just be very strange to uh, to turn one into the other. Um, so I don't know. I they might reach out to me. I mean, the Russos have reached out to me a few times over the years, asking me a question or or something like that. So that might happen with book two or Stephen. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I really feel like he, he got the, the sensibility of it really well and um, didn't do too much, which I was worried about. I'd read the script, so I knew what was in there, but like to actually see him do it, I was really impressed. Of course, you realize the vulnerability is that only Ryan Gosling can be in a gray man movie now. Which is, you know, why, why Matthew, Mc I mean, that's why the Lincoln lawyer didn't have another movie, you know, oh, and they have want... a different guy on television. Mm -hmm. So there's a plus and a minus about a big yeah. star yeah. In, in your film. You want to hand me that book right there? So we've come to the moment when, let's first of all, thank our authors for coming this evening. Thank you guys for coming. Really. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.